So 1 John chapter 3, I know we had read verse 4 because that's our definition of sin. Best one the Bible gives us, very clear, very, very concise. Sin is the transgression of the law, the old King James says, or here in the new King James, it says that sin is uh, lawlessness. So we, uh, we got that far. And so in verse five, speaking of Christ, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him, there is no sin. So we remember where John the Baptist we got the scripture there, John 1, verse 29. John, his cousin, John the Baptist, saw Christ and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who bears away the sins of the world. And so that's why he came. I have a couple of other scriptures there. Hopefully you can see the notes. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, uh, how he became sin. He became sin on our behalf and bore it away. And then also Hebrews 4, verse 15, that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So he's the only human to come and live a completely perfect life. So let's, uh, let's go on to verse 6. I think this is actually where we wrapped it up. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. So he's saying here, and John continues this pattern, that if we walk with Christ, that if we seek to emulate the way he lived life, then the better we do that with God's help, the less we will sin. But we all have lots of experience in realizing that reality is that we are going to fall short. Uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet the long-term intention that we make mistakes, and then if our intention is to get up, seek God's forgiveness, ask God for the help to continue on down the path toward eternal life, then that's, that's what God expects and asks of us. Verse 7, again, he uses this phrase, little children, and again, as we've covered before, we're reading the words from a man who is well up in his 90s, probably by this time. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. In other words, th that is the lifestyle, living the righteous way, which is defined as living within the commandments of God, just as he is righteous. So, but again, a warning. He keeps coming back to this. We'll see more of this in, in chapter four, a warning that human beings will try to trip us up. The church at Philadelphia and the letter there in Revelation three was told to beware that no one, no man takes your crown. So what we do, what we practice says more about our character than what we, the lip service we may give to it by what we say. Verse 8, he who sins is of the devil. Now, devil here comes from the Greek diabolos, and the word means a slanderer, a false accuser. And that is what Satan was and has been and continues to be. John 8, verse 44 is here on the screen. John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. Now, these are the words of Christ speaking to some of the uh, religious leaders of his day. The desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. So the verse, verse 8 continues, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So sin originated with Satan. 
we are probably all very familiar with the story that comes from Ezekiel 28, as far as this king of Tyre. And it all began with Satan. It all began with one thought of pride. And that led him down a path, the path of sin, path of leading others, because sin is very contagious. And he led one third of the angels in the wrong way. But um, extra, uh, Ezekiel 28 verses 15 through 17 are there as a reference that uh, you were filled with violence. But uh, well, the end of verse 15, till iniquity was found in you. So that's where it started. And of course, Isaiah 14, we, we know those verses as well. The five I wills, where ultimately it led Satan to make that statement, I will be like the most high. So to me, that says that he wanted God the Father's role, his position. So before Jesus began his ministry, he was tempted by Satan. We've commented on that. In fact, last time, the same temptations that he used toward Adam and Eve were the same that he used toward Jesus, and those are the same that he uses toward us probably every day of our lives without even knowing it. But Jesus came to completely destroy and completely erase the, the fingerprints of Satan from off of this world. Okay, verse 9 Whoever has been born of God does not sin. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Now, the Holy Spirit, of course, is God's seed. He refers to the seed here. Uh, this begins imparting the mind of God to us under the guidance of the the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we, we then are led to walk within the parameters of the commandments that outline God's intention for us. In Romans 8, noticing verses 9 and 16, Paul wrote, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not uh, his, uh, he is not his. I think, no, I copied and pasted that. Anyhow, it reads a little different in the, uh, the King James. Verse 16, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So, um, the way John writes, as I've mentioned before, his mind thinks differently than mine does. Uh, mind, mine does. He thinks in concepts, these great overriding principles. Uh, I want just the facts. Just give me three points and, and, and help me understand it that way. So John says things sometimes from one particular point of view, and then he comes and he looks at it from another point of view. But he's saying that anyone who abides in God does not continue as a sinner, let alone a deliberate sinner. He is step by step changing to become more in line with the example that Christ set. Okay, let's uh, go to the next section here. Verses 11 through 18 shift focus in a bit. They focus on how to love one another. John continually stresses, you've got to love God, and you also have to love fellow man. These two come together as a package. You cannot separate the first great commandment from the second. We have to take them together. So in verse 10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. So they are made obvious. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. So two opposites. John's a, a man, we would say he's, he's black and white. It's this way or it's the other way. There's no middle ground. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. But he speaks here of practicing righteousness, and that speaks of obedience. And then he 
connects that with love for his brother. So these are the demonstrable traits as proof that God is living his life within us. In verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And that really is a message that would have been taught all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Adam, Eve, their sons, Cain, Abel, first children, would all have been taught the way of love. And of course, we find the first, the second great commandment all the way back in Leviticus. Uh, when Jesus gave the great commandments, he was quoting from back in the law. But Leviticus 19, verse 18, you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the eternal. And verse 12, not as Cain. So he draws a contrast. Who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother? And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So this statement and others add to what little were given back in Genesis chapter 4. But obviously Cain was acting under the influence of Satan. And ultimately, because Cain had sinned, his works were evil. And because Abel's works were righteous, he rose up and killed his brother. He attacked him. He murdered him because he was guilty. And, you know, a lot of times people, human beings, will attack others because of guilt. They'll know they're wrong. And especially when they see a person who is striving to do what is right, that becomes a threat. And I remember hearing Mr. Herbert Armstrong mention that there are those who accuse, who are often guilty of their own accusation of others. And that's just uh, just comes from human nature, studying human nature. It's the way it works. Evil people will instinctively hate those who are striving to live a righteous life. And that's because that righteous person like Abel would have been, was a walking, talking, living rebuke of Cain. And so the world will often, we are, we are told that the world will hate us and the world will, will see their own condemnation reflected in the lives of those who are striving to live by God, by God's way. Verse 13, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Well, on that last Passover night that Jesus was here, John 15, verse 19, he mentions latter part of that verse, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And then in chapter 16, verse 33, and at least one phrase of that verse is, in the world you will have tribulation. So because of striving to live God's way, there will come grief, there will be attacks, there will be hatred sometimes. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life. In other words, the death penalty that had been there hanging over us has been lifted off. Because we love the brethren, he who does not love his brother abides in death. So again, truly loving one another serves as that demonstrable proof that we are God's. We are God's, that's God apostrophe S. We are God's people. Verse 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Now in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, as it says here, Matthew 5, verses 21 to 24, you have heard it was said of, uh, to those of old, you shall not murder. And then he expands that. It includes hatred uh, is breaking the spirit of murder. Uh, hating a brother or sister breaks the spirit of murder. So that murderer has, has uh, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
Okay, verse uh, 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And so not only did the Father give up his only Son, but Jesus willingly laid down his life for us. And we're very familiar with John 3, 16 and 17. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. And so latter part of verse 17, that the world through him might be saved. And God is about the business of adding as many as he possibly can to the book of life. All right, so verse um, verse 16, latter part, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we are called to go and do likewise, essentially. We give up our time, give words of encouragement, we serve, we visit, we fellowship. All right, we go now, verses 17 and 18. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And again, that underscores a statement from a while ago that uh, our true character and our devotion to God is demonstrated by what we do a lot more than the words that we may speak. So we go to another, another focus here in verses 19 through the end of this chapter. And these verses speak of the confidence that we are to have in God's salvation. It is offered to us. It is given to us. It's something we look to the full realization, but it is sure, sure and it is certain even now. Pardon me. In verse 19, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Now, any human being tends to get these little nagging feelings of doubt. Um, the book of Job, the uh, one book I read uh, many years ago, Philip Yancey's book, uh, Disappointment with God, he he looked at Job, that Job was asking these nagging little questions. God, are you still there? God, do you still love me? God, are you still working in my life? And we all probably sometimes have those moments of doubt when Satan's trying the door to our mind, see if he can get in. But it uses the word assure, and it means to persuade or to set at rest. And so God will set at rest our heart before him. The spirit of God is not a spirit of fear, but it provides the confidence, the reassurance that we are on track and in harmony with, with where God is leading us. The presence of love proves that God is working in and through us. Verse 20. For our, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Well, the woman caught in the act of adultery there in John chapter 8 would be one example. And Jesus simply told her, go and sin no more. Turn your life around. Turn back from the way of sin where you've been walking. Turn and go and walk toward God. We also have the Old Testament example of David with his sin with Bathsheba and then the, the deceit and the, the giving of the command that led to the, the killing of the murder of Uriah. Um, and then Psalm 51 tells us of his story of repentance and, and God pouring out his forgiveness. Uh, guilt can be one of the great tools that Satan uses. And he uses that to try to distract us to get us to sit down on the bench and stop running the Christian race. And uh, we, we need not carry around guilt after God forgives us. We should have, by the body and blood of Christ, a clear conscience and go forward. But Satan knows that it, probably for all of us, the most difficult person to forgive is ourselves. And so God gives us through his spirit this assurance that we are 
headed down the right path. Verse 21, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And, you know, speaking here of the conscience, the conscience has to first be trained of being one who trembles at God's word and study and pour over God's scriptures and then beginning the process of, of obeying and, and the conscience is developed over time. If our conscience then, once trained, is not condemning us, then that too is reassurance. It is gives confidence that we are in a, a solid relationship with God. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments. So again, keeping commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So we're familiar with the story back in Matthew, Matthew 19, verse 17. So he said to him, why do you call me good? There's, there's none good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. So we pray. We ask God for a proper motive. We pray for understanding. We do not pray to tell God what he needs to do for us. We pray to ask God to open our minds to see what his will is on a given matter. Now, I want to take a little, a little side trip here as we broach here, as he has already, the topic of prayer. Five keys to answered prayer. And uh, first one is know or seek the will of God. And as we will read when we get to chapter 5, verse 14, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So it has to be in accordance with the will of God, not the will of David or whatever your name is, the will of God. A second point, point B, is ask in faith. And we saw that when we went through the epistle of James, James 1, verse 6. But let him ask in faith with, with no doubting. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Third point, point C, is ask in Christ's name. So Jesus on that last Passover again, he taught them, John 14, verse 14, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And then here we, of course, we've just read verse 22. That's our fourth point. Point D is obey. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And then point E, fifth point is persevere. Persevere. And we remember the story Jesus gave of the, the widow who cried out, the persistent widow who went over and over and over and over to the unjust judge, but she would not give up. And then he summarized it, Luke 18, verse 7. Shall, not God, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? So even if an unjust judge of this world will finally hear and act, how much more so a God who is our father and wants to see us become a part of his eternal family. Verse 23. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, believe on the name. It involves a lot more than there are far too many in the Christian world who, well, if you just believe, then that's, it's, it's as though that's all you have to do once you make that profession. It hinges with believing, but also loving one another and then continuing in that. Um, to say believe on his name means believing in the, 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 the whole 
embodiment of the nature and character of Christ. And we, we believe in much more than just a name. It's not just a magical name that we recite over and over, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. It's, uh, it's the whole character, example, way of life, everything that he taught. And then when that is accompanied with loving one another, with the same type of a selfless, sacrificial, forgiving love, then uh, again, reassurance that we're on the right path. And then in verse 24, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us and the spirit whom he has given us. Christian's life is a combination of right belief and right conduct. As James wrote, he was going to demonstrate his faith by his works. Okay, let's, uh, well, let's notice Galatians 2 verse 20 is there on the screen where Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for him or for me. So that's a that's a good one to tie in there as well. Now let's go on to chapter four. And I think I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster here. I would like to conclude our survey of of 1 John tonight. The first six verses, he goes to very stern warning against false prophets. And he does so by contrasting the spirit of truth with the spirit of error. So in verse 1, 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, we have covered throughout this series the reality of some of the early Gnostic teachings, and a related kind of an extreme part of that was the docetism. These heresies taught that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. Uh, Docetism, uh, the Greek dokian, seems, or just they say that Jesus only appeared as if he was here, but he was spirit. Well, there were strange, curious ideas going around at that time, but they've always been around. Back in the Pentateuch, the the early books of the Bible, Jesus, uh, rather, well, Jesus as the God of the Old Testament warned them through Moses, Deuteronomy 13 verses one through five. If there rises a prophet or dreamer of dreamers, he gives you a sign or wonder. If it comes to pass, well, I I don't think I'll take the time to read all of this. But verse 4, you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments. So in verse 5, that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. So there was a very stern price to pay. There are other scriptures here. Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 to 22. If a prophet presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, then that prophet was to die. So something was very, very serious. Ezekiel, a couple of chapters, Ezekiel 13 and then Ezekiel 34 very strong cautions, or woe actually is presented against the foolish prophets who went out among the people who were not speaking for God. And then in chapter 34 of Ezekiel, woe to the shepherds who scatter the flock. Jeremiah also, Jeremiah 23, woe to the shepherds who were destroying the flock. Second Corinthians 11 verses 13 through 15 speaks of Satan's ministers appearing as if they actually were apostles of Christ. 
And then a very important scripture to tie in is whenever there's any doubt, some new teaching, some new heresy, some new ideas, somebody starts throwing around Isaiah 8, verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So in verse 2, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So there again, you see this connection back to the, the early Gnostic teachings of that time. And again, largely they denied that Christ was here in the flesh. They said the flesh is evil. And so he was spirit and he was only spirit. John 1 verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So John is the one answering this heresy and John was there from the earliest stages of, of Christ calling disciples. And he was the one that last night reclining against Jesus on the Passover. He saw him, he heard him, he traveled with him, he, he touched him, he felt him. He's the one who knew he came in the flesh. So to be of God, a person acknowledges that Jesus as a Messiah, literally came in the flesh. All right, verse three. Verse three, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now there's that term Antichrist. John is the one exclusively who uses the phrase there are many who many today who will use that and it's in reference to what revelation calls the beast this leader of the beast and or to the false prophet uh, from the book of revelation but it more accurately refers to teachings that denied jesus had come in the flesh the term actually refers to those who are the opponents of christ verse 4 you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so the them, these false teachers, would surely include some of those teaching Gnostic, Gnostic heresy at that time. And uh, remember here, 2 Kings 6, verse 16, 2 Kings 6, verse 16. And let's see, I'm drawing a blank. Elijah or Elisha? That would be Elisha, yeah. Elisha and his servant, and the servant all distraught that the city had been surrounded by the Syrian army. And Elisha reminded him, do not fear. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the same is true for us. We do have an adversary, but uh, we have a God who is uh, far above and beyond, sovereign over that adversary. In verse 5, they are of the world, therefore they speak as a world. The world hears them. So the attitudes of these false teachers are revealed by their words and those in the world. Um, resonate with them. There's a, there's a meeting of the mind. They're on the same wavelength as these uh, false teachers. The world knows its own, but also like Jesus said, John 10 verse 27, that chapter when he talks about uh, the sheep, the shepherd, the, the flock, and he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They know me. So the Spirit of God is that which allows us to hear the voice of Jesus Christ as he leads us through the means that he uses. All right, verse uh, 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there's another example, this contrast. Spirit of truth, spirit of error. 
And the Spirit of God is that which distinguishes between those. Romans 8, verse 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. The carnal mind is anti-God. It is anti-law. Now, Christians do not need to fear heretics, but hopefully we learn how to refute them. We always have our guard up. And as he said at the beginning of the chapter, we're always testing the spirits, whether they are of God. In uh, this um, William Barclay's uh, commentary, page 107, he said that John returns to his favorite contrasting theme, the opposition between the world and God. The world is human nature apart from and in opposition to God. Well, again, I won't read all of this. Yeah, I'm going to skip over this. Let's go on to the next sesh, uh, section here. Verse 7 through the rest of the chapter. Um, and, uh, define love, again. Uh, but also emphasizes that God is love and then teaches us further how we are to love one another. He refers to or he uses the word agape or agapeo. Uh, not pronouncing that right. Agapeo. Agapeo. Uh, love of God. It is used, I believe it's 48 times in, in this book. And uh, the only way to have this agape is to be given God's spirit. Verse 7, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And when Paul gave a listing of the fruits of the spirit, the first one given was love. And as we grow in love, as we then act in accordance with the law of God that defines it and breaks it down, then we, we grow. Uh, we are never more like God than when we show love, demonstrate love one to another. Now, verse 8, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And here in uh, Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then he lists several of the laws. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, etc. The law points us toward the love of God. It breaks it down into understandable pieces of just simple actions and thoughts and things that we can do. Verse 10, uh, in Romans 13, verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment. It is the point we aim for of the law. Law and love correspond to each other. All right, verse, uh, verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So both father and son gave the ultimate sacrifice. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation, the atoning blood that covered our sins. Christ took that on himself and paid the price instead of us. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, and he did certainly, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. And so I have on the screen a couple of scriptures from John's gospel. John 1, verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. 
John 6, verse 46, not that anyone has seen the Father. Continuing in verse 12, if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. So Matthew 25, verse 40, that's kind of the culmination of the parable about Christ appearing in his kingdom, the nations before him. He's separating to the right hand and the left hand. And uh, those who were welcomed to the kingdom, he told them in as much as you did this to one of these, the least of my brethren, you did it to me. So as we serve, as we sacrifice for each other, we do so to God. And this perfects, this carries to completion the love of God by living it, by acting out on it. Verse 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. A couple of scriptures just as references, Romans 8 verse 9. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And then Romans 8 verse 14, as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are sons of God. All right. Then in verse 14, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Again, John was there. John spent as much time with Christ than, than, than most. Maybe, you know, of course, James, John, Peter, they were kind of the three that went to the transfiguration and went a little further with Christ when he was praying at Gethsemane, but he probably spent more time with Christ than any other disciple, unless there are just a few others. Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and, and he in God. Verse 16, when we have known and believed the love that God has for us, God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in the world. So the presence of the Spirit of God should embolden us to look to the future. And as we yield to God through his spirit, we begin reflecting the very same character traits of Christ to the world around us. Oh, there, there I've got it. John uses the word love 48 times in this first epistle. 48 times. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, let me see here. Oh, I need to scroll up some more. To the degree we love, we are freed from fear. Fear focuses on self and what might happen to self. Guilt from sin engenders fear, and fear is tormenting. Well, we're told by Paul, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, the spirit is not a spirit of fear. It doesn't come from God. But we do see examples where when Jesus walked the earth, some of the demons who possessed people, they would cry out, such as in Matthew 8, verse 29, are you here, or what do we have to do with you, you son of God? Are you here to torment us ahead of our time? So they recognize there's a time of judgment. They recognize it's a bleak outlook, and they are tormented by that. Satan is the father of fear. 
Again, it's focused inward towards self. But there are many fears. I'm not saying all fear is wrong. Many fears are, are, are there for a reason. But I do know from lots of personal examples or experience, fear of public speaking is one of the greatest fears human beings will ever face. And there's a lot of self-consciousness involved. I died, a, I died a slow death every time I had to speak in church for 12 years until I recognized God opened my mind and I could see its X amount of my own vanity. And I asked his forgiveness and it immediately got a lot easier because the focus was on what can I do to serve God's people, not what is this doing to me? Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. 20, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Uh, you know, Paul, John doesn't mince words. He just calls it as he sees it, calls it as, as it is. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. And again, remember the Gnostics of that day. They felt this, they had this higher level of knowledge. They were superior to others. And yet again, as he stresses here, essentially you can't separate the first four commandments from the latter six or the first great commandment from the second. They go together. It's a part of a package. Chapter five. The first early verses define the love of God. Verses one through three. Verses four through 10 explain that we can overcome through faith with God's help. And then 11 through 19 explain how we can under, overcome through trials and walk by faith. And at the end, he stresses we must avoid placing anything or anyone above God because he says, keep yourselves from idols. So I'm looking at the clock here. I might go a little over tonight, but it's good material. It's not going to hurt us. Thumbs up. I appreciate that. Verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten. So God's building a family. In terms like father, son, brother, sister, mother, these are all family terms. If we love God, we have to love the brethren. We have to love our, his children. We are born into a human family, but then as Christians, we are adopted further into God's family. We love the God who created us. We love the others whom God has called. And also, for that matter, since for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, we too must have a deep abiding love for the world. And grieve over the, the suffering the world goes through. Verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. So again, he comes back to that from various points of view. Love for God is evidenced by keeping his commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So obedience is proof of our love for the one who gave these wonderful laws. They are not heavy burdens. Some of us remember well back in the mid 90s, suddenly discovering that we had been going to church services with people who had perhaps all along viewed 
the Sabbath and other aspects of God's law as this heavy weight that had been had been burdening them. And uh, and we wondered what in the world happened. Well, love and obedience go together. The power of that Passover night, John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And we already read in Romans 13, verse 10, that love is the fulfilling of the law. Verse 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory he has, or that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So we looked at James. James is called the apostle of faith. We looked at Peter's two epistles. Peter's called the epistle for the, the apostle of hope. And now John obviously is called the apostle of love, but he also brings in faith and he brings in hope. And he's going to write some things in this last chapter to give them hope. To give them, as he already has, reassurance that uh, God's plan is right on time and um, we should fear not, as Jesus said, fear not. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So when God works in our life, he provides the strength that allows us to follow through and succeed. Paul wrote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Faith enables us to stand against the attacks of the world. They tried to destroy Christ and failed. And with his help, the same will be said of us. Verse 6, this is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only of water, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. Now we're getting to a section where most of our modern translations have corrected it. But I have with me my old wide margin King James. And in verses 7 and 8, there were some words that were clearly added in later. And I'll read something, something from William Barclay about that in a moment. But words were added in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth. So this was added later. It was not in the original Greek, but it was added to provide a proof, to provide a proof for the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as if there were three persons, three personages, three beings who were also one. Well, it was bogus. And uh, that is the primary verse teaching the Trinity. And if it's bogus, what does that say? Well, Verse 6, the, the water obviously refers to baptism. Christ sent that, set that example for us. And it refers to blood. He gave his life, sacrificed his life. The life is in the, life is in the blood. Uh, both are essential aspects of Jesus having come to be our Messiah. Again, remember the Gnostics denied that Jesus came in the flesh. And if he didn't come in the flesh, then he didn't have blood that could be shed. But John underscores he gave his life, his life's blood for man's sins. So verses 7 and 8 are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. These three are one. There are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree in one. I'm sorry I indicated earlier, I thought the New King James had fixed that, but it does not. So let me go to William Barclay. The words again are the ones in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. 
and there are three that bear witness in earth. Okay, those are the words. Here's what he writes about them. It is quite certain that it does not belong, that th these words do not belong in the original text. It does not occur in any Greek manuscript earlier than the fourth century. So, you know, that's 300, end of the 300s AD. The great manuscript manuscripts belong to the third and fourth century. It occurs in none of them. None of the early church fathers of, uh, knew it. Jerome's original version of the Latin Vulgate does not include these words. The first person to quote them is a Spanish heretic called Priscillian around 385 AD. And after that, it gradually began creeping into Latin texts of the New Testament. Well, I won't go on and read all of this, but Barclay sums it up by saying modern, modern scholarship has established that John did not, did not write this. It is, it is a much later commentary on and addition to his words and that is why modern translations omit it. So the Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, they do not have it. Most don't, but again, the King James has it. The thought should be from verse 7, there are three that bear record. Then dropping halfway into verse 8, the spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree in one. That's uh, really what that verse should be focusing on. Again, best verse that they have to teach the Trinity, and it's, uh, it's fake. Verse 9. Verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. Now, let's remember the back of the Old Testament law. It called for two or three witnesses for establishing of an accusation, a testimony, whatever. Two or three had to witness for a person to be condemned as guilty. A double or triple witness by humans established a report. How much more so a double or triple divine witness? So here he's referring to the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three witness the fact that Jesus came. He was the Messiah. And the Spirit of God within us testifies that we conduct ourselves as God would have us live. Verse 11. I know we're hurrying over this part a little bit, but I, I hope it's understandable enough. 11. This is the testimony that God has given us uh, eternal life. and This life is in his Son. He who does not have, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So bringing in the aspect of hope here, that uh, if we have Christ living within us, it leads us peace of mind, serenity. It uh, counteracts the frustrations of, of daily life. Okay, verse 14. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we cover that in the, the five keys to prayer. First one was, we need to know the will of God and pray in accordance with that will. 
if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Again, always subject to the will of God, always asking for the right person, right purpose, right reason, right attitude. Prayer focuses less on asking God for what we want than it is asking God what he wants. Okay, verses 16 and 17, we have a couple of verses here that we, we have this, there's a sin unto death and there's a sin not unto death. Um, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin. There is a sin not leading to death. Well, in, in a nutshell, the, the difference here, we, we know the wages of sin is death. A sin that does not lead to death is one where the person, God's been working there, there's still the Spirit of God. Maybe they, maybe like David, they drift from God, they make mistakes, but then when it comes down to it, they repent, seek God's forgiveness, and God's strength to go forward. But a sin unto death is one for which a person does not and has no intention of repenting of. Some sin is committed unknowingly or accidentally. Some sin is because of weakness. Um, other sins are deliberate. And the root cause may be arrogance as the person defiantly acts contrary to God's law and, and God's will. They know it's wrong and they will not change. So Barclay wrote on this verse, as long as people in their heart of hearts hate sin and hate themselves for sinning, as long as they know that they are sinning, they're never beyond repentance and therefore never beyond forgiveness. But once they begin to revel in sin and make it the deliberate policy of their lives, they're on the way to, they're on the way to death because they have no intention of changing. Okay, let me keep moving down here. You might want to tie in, make a note of Hebrews 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully, and that's the key word, willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. This is the person who says in their heart, this is wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. I will not turn, repent, and follow God. Verse 18, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin, and he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So on the one hand, we look to a time of being literally fully born of spirit into the family of God when sin will be a thing of the past. But for now, we've been given God's spirit to help lead us away from sin, but we will fall. We will make mistakes. We need to have the attitude of Paul there at the end of 1 Corinthians 9. He talked about how he was like running a race and he was disciplining himself, verse 27, bring it into subjection, lest he would become disqualified. Okay, let's, uh, let's wrap it up with verses 20 and 21. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, Paul, excuse me, John, most likely is in Ephesus. 
writing to members in that area of Asia Minor. And they lived in a city with, that seemed to be completely run by the worship of the goddess Diana. Temple of Diana there was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was a center of immorality. And uh, anyhow, in verses 20 and 21, um, Dr. Ward, when he covered this, when I listened to his class many years ago, he, uh, he often will talk about life's great questions. Who am I? What is God or is there a God? What is God? Where did I come from? Where am I going? And um, when we became in Christ, we became God's children. And from that time on, we began learning the, the what, who, where, when, and how of life, where God's plan was going. But as far as idolatry, William Barclay writes, Christians must never be lost in the illusions of idolatrous religion. They must never set up in their hearts an idol which will take the place of God. They must keep themselves from the infections of all false faiths. And they can only do that when they walk in Christ. So that brings us to our conclusion of uh, John's first epistle. I'll take the notes down.